uh, turn to Revelation 13, and uh, let's, let's start out asking some questions. We're going to ask some questions. Now, do you believe your Bible? You believe, when you read it, you believe it. You believe what it says. That doesn't mean you have to understand everything that it says, but when you read it, even if you don't understand it, you just say, I believe that. That's what God said, and so I believe it. And so this is what we're going to do this week. I've, God has given me uh, just, and I'm nowhere near done put this together, and there's no way in the world that I'm going to get done in the three nights that we have with all the material that I brought down just for this meeting, and I understand that. I don't have uh, an idea of where we're going to go tonight or how far we're going to go. We're just going to go for a while. We're going to stop. It's like a big, you remember they used to sell bologna like this? Okay, this is my sermon. It's bologna week, and we're going to cut her off just whatever we feel like it, all right? So uh, that's how we're going to do it. I asked Brother John if you were milk drinkers or meat eaters. And if you understand what that means, then you're a meat eater. If you don't, you're a milk drinker. And we desire sincere milk of the work, a mil sincere milk of the Word of God, but th that we may grow thereby, but we grow and we become meat eaters. And so there are deep, deep things in the Word of God that I want to try to draw your attention to tonight. So I'm going to try to go slow. I'm going to try to um, uh, not, this is not going to be much of an exciting teaching, exciting things that I'm going to show you. Some of it may perk your interest, but we're just going to delve deep into the Word of God and we're going to take our time doing it. So uh, Revelation 13, we know certain things from the Bible. We know that Jesus is coming back. We know that he's going to reign for a thousand years. We know then that before he establishes his kingdom from Jerusalem, we know there's going to be a time before that, and we know that a man that the Bible has given many titles to, son of perdition, man of sin, the Assyrian, the idle shepherd, um, the uh, son of perdition, the beast, the Antichrist, we know that he is going to make an appearance on the earth. He is going to be revealed. He has not been revealed yet. So everything that we dig up from the word of God this week, we're going to keep it stored in our minds, and it's going to sort of give us an idea of who he, a general idea of who he is, what he is, what he's doing, what his work is going to be, but we're not going to know for sure specifically who he is until a certain day. On a certain day, the Bible says, then he is going to be revealed. But right now, he's not revealed. We don't know who he is. And I want you to think of it like this. Think of back in the old days when a woman was going to be with child, nobody knew who this child was going to be. You didn't even know what to name it because you didn't know if it was going to be a boy or girl until the day the baby arrived. That was back in the days when the doctors came out and said, it's a boy or it's a girl. Now we have ultrasounds. We have re ways to find that out. But back in those days, nobody knew until the certain day when the baby came. And so think along those terms because I think the Bible is giving us that same terminology concerning the coming of the beast. He's not revealed yet, but he is going to be revealed on a certain day, on a specific day. So let's look at some things from our Bible. Turn to Revelation 13, and I want you to hold your place there, and uh, because we're going to go back to that in a minute. But I want you to turn to Revelation 17. There are several chapters in the Bible that give us the indication of who the beast is, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, where he's coming from, um, where he is currently right now. I do not believe that he is on the earth right now. I do not believe that. I believe that he's going to be. But right now, I do not think that. Revelation 17, let's look there. Uh, let's go to verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither. And I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore 
that sitteth upon many waters. This, of course, is Mystery Babylon the Great. There's even a lot of questions in people's mind about who or what Mystery Babylon is. Some say it's the Vatican, old preachers from days gone by. They, they had it in their heart that the Vatican was Mystery Babylon the Great, that she was that great whore, and they preached about it, and they wrote about it, and I don't disagree with them. I'm one of these that still believes that the Church of Rome is still an abomination. They have idols in their church, and they bow and pray to those idols, and God said, don't do that, that's an abomination. Can I get an amen? So we, we don't believe that way. So, he says, I'm going to show unto you the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. What are those waters that she's sitting on? What do they represent? Verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth had committed fornication. The inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So this is... The same beast that you see in Revelation 13, and we'll look at that here in a little bit. He has seven heads, and he has ten horns. And so does the Bible mean that in a literal sense? Does this beast, number one, is it really an animal, a creature, a beast? Is it really a beast? Does he really have seven heads and ten horns, or is that merely symbolism? Is it merely just a metaphor for something else? You know how we say one thing, like he's up the creek without a paddle, when what we really mean is he is in a serious situation that we're not sure he's going to make it out of. That's what we really mean. So is the seven heads and ten horns a metaphor, or does this beast really have seven heads and ten horns? I'll answer that in a little bit. So we have... Um, in verse 4, the woman was arrayed in purple, in scarlet color, decked with gold, precious stones and pearls, and having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. What do you think that cup is? What do you think it represents? What, do you think the, what kind of wine do you think is in that cup? Let me, you got your place there in Revelation 17. Hold your place there. Let's turn to Deuteronomy 32. Because I'm going to tell you something. We passed a church on the way down Highway 32. And I said, look there, Lisa, that's the church Brother John was telling us about. And the sign out front said... Uh, come in, open minds, we don't judge. Is that what it said? Come as you are, no judgment. Are, no judgment. Okay? Half of that I don't mind. I don't mind people coming to church as they are, but I expect them to leave different when they leave. Or I haven't done, or the Holy Spirit hasn't done the job that he's supposed to do. But anyway, so do you think, let me just ask a question. Do you think that people who openly practice adultery and fornication can go to that church and feel comfortable sitting in that church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday? Do you think people who are living together without the blessing of marriage can go to that church and be used in ministry in that church and not be judged and feel comfortable going there knowing that it's never, ever, ever going to be preached on at that church? Probably. Do you think that there are people in Laclede County who are sodomites? I think I saw them at Walmart a while ago. Because if you're going to find them, that's where they're going to be. Do you think that sodomites can go to that church and feel comfortable there knowing that their sin is never going to be preached on in that church? Probably. Let me ask you this. Do you think it should be preached on? Absolutely. Do you think the sin of adultery should be preached on in any church? Do you think 
couples shacking up, do you think that should be preached on? I do. But let me tell you why it's not. Deuteronomy chapter 32, and I'm telling you this for a reason. We're going to look at what Babylon has in her cup. Deuteronomy 32, this is Moses, and he says in verse 31, for their rock is not as our rock. Now notice there's two rocks in that verse. One of them's not capitalized, one of them is. What do you think that means? One of them is talking about Jesus, capital R. One of them is not talking about Jesus. For their rock is not as our rock. You see, our rock is the rock of our salvation, and that rock is Jesus Christ. Amen? That rock is this book upon which my life, my ministry, my preaching, your pastor's ministry, this church is founded upon that rock, the capital R, Jesus Christ. So if those guys have a rock and their rock is not as our rock, then who is their rock? It's Beast Week. So their rock is the beast. Their rock is the opposite of Jesus Christ, which would be the Antichrist. So that's their rock. Their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. In other words, that church that says, come as you are, we don't judge, they would not have a disagreement with us saying that their church is nowhere near this church. Right? Because on your church sign, you actually say, 1611 authorized King James Bible. I doubt 100% that they even touch the 1611 King James Bible in that church. And I'm saying that for a reason, because this passage here tells you where they're getting their ideas from and their doctrine from. Their rock is not as our rock, and they themselves, if you were to ask the people of that church, are you King James only? They would say, ooh, get out of here. Okay? We use all the translations. We go with all the Bibles, right? So they wouldn't disagree with the fact that they are different than this church. So their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of what? What does it say? Vine of Sodom. Now hold your, you're going to have like stuff stuck all in your Bible. So take that and put it there. And then go to John 15. John 15. Maybe in another couple of hours I'll get to the slides that are up on the screen, all right? John chapter 15. Look at verse 1 where it says, I am the true vine. Who is that? So it's Jesus. So now we have... If you kept your place here, we have the true vine, John 15, Jesus Christ. And we have their vine, which is the vine of Sodom. Let's just say that Sodom is the opposite of heavenly Jerusalem. Because in heavenly Jerusalem, there are no Sodomites. And in Sodom, there are no saints. God pulled them out. Okay, God said, come out from among her and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So their vine is the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Notice that their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter. Their wine, here it is right here. This is what Babylon is holding in her cup. Their wine is the poison of what? Dragons. Now, do you believe in dragons? You should. Because in Revelation 12, it describes that there's a dragon in heaven who starts a war with Michael and his angels, and the dragon and his angels were cast out of heaven, and then the Bible says that dragon 
is Satan, the old devil, the serpent. So I believe in dragons. I believe in this dragon here and the wine that comes from the vine of Sodom is the poison of dragons and it says the cruel venom of asps, which are serpents. They're venomous, poisonous serpents. All right? What form does that poison come in? Hold your place here. Genesis chapter 3. By the time I get done tonight, you'll know where all the books of the Bible are. Genesis chapter 3. This is the poison of dragons. Here's the venom of serpents. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, First thing out of Satan's mouth is, Yea, hath God said. What is he doing here? He's questioning the authority and the authenticity of God's word. He is casting doubt in Eve's mind of whether or not God's word actually came from God's mouth. Now, I asked you the question when we started, do you believe your Bible? Do you believe that it is the word of God and it is it alone is the word of God? There is no other book in the world that is the word of God, that is the truth of God, that is the true vine. Because when Jesus said, I am the vine, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman, he then said, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. What that means is, is that if you are hooked into the word of God, you are part of the vine of Jesus Christ. Because he said, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, then ye shall ask what you will and your father shall give it to you. And so it's very clear to me that this teaching from De Deuteronomy 32 and, and John chapter 15 has to do with doctrine. It has to do with the words that people end up believing. And so if you say that you believe Every word of God is pure. You believe everything in your Bible is right, including God made the universe in six days. You believe that one? Not six billion years, not 13 billion years, six days. And how do we know they were literal days? Well, it says so in the evening and the morning were the first day. In the evening and the morning were the second day. That tells you right there that they were 24-hour days, just like what we know now. And I believe my God created the universe six days, 6,000 years ago. I don't believe anything else. And I don't care how much information they pile up over here. God's word said, this is how it is. And this is what I believe. Because as a Christian, I'm not allowed to cherry pick what parts of the Bible I believe and what parts I don't. I can't say, well, I believe John 3, 15, but that whole deal about Noah's Ark and it covering all the mountains of the earth, I don't think that really happened that way. You see, if I say that, then I'm either a liar or I'm calling God a liar and you cannot call God a liar and then expect God to give you eternal life. Doesn't work that way. So we just believe the Bible. So you believe what God said. And in John 15, that means that you are the branches of the vine, which means that you receive of the nourishment of Jesus Christ through his word. Then we have those who drink from the vine of Sodom, the poison of, of serpents. And that poison is, number one, yea, hath God said, questioning the authority of God's word. Number two, the second thing he said in verse four is, ye shall not surely die. That is a direct contradiction to what God said in Genesis 2 when he said, ye shall surely, he said, the day ye eat thereof, ye shall surely die. Well, then Satan comes along and he says, oh, no, 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 you shall not surely die. So what he's done is, number one, he's questioned the authority. He's got Eve thinking, maybe God didn't really say this. Because Eve never heard it from God. She heard it from Adam. God spoke that to Adam. Then he created Eve. 
And so she must have got it from Adam, but she didn't hear it from God. So now she's not sure if God really said this, number one. Number two, now he's told her that God lied to her in saying, ye shall surely die. Because now she's thinking, well, he said, I will not surely die. So maybe I'll live. So now the third thing, here's what he's doing. Now that he's questioned the authority of the God's word, now that he's directly contradicted God's word, now he's going to replace God's word. He's going to replace the doctrine that God laid down to Adam and to her, and he's going to replace it with something that God never said. Notice what he said. He said in verse 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as what? God's. You know, I used, to, I, I, I used to think for some reason, I don't know why I did this, but I used to think it said ye shall be as God, singular, like God in heaven. I used to think it said that. And then I went and read it, and I said, no, it says ye shall be as gods. Gods are like the, the angels in the heavens, both good and bad, and these gods, they never die. They are immortal creatures. They've existed ever since the creation. They've, none of them has ever died. Some have been cast into prison, but they've never died. And so what he's telling her is that ye shall be higher than what you are now because God made us a little lower than the angels. So now he's saying, God's, you're gonna, if you actually eat of this fruit that God said don't eat from it, if you eat from it, then number one, you're going to receive illumination. Your eyes are going to be open. Number two, then you're going to be as the gods and ye shall not surely die. That is the vine of Sodom. So let's go back, uh, Deuteronomy 32. I've got to keep track here. Deuteronomy 32, their vine, verse 32, their vine is the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Then he said, is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures. So, here's what I'm going to ask you. The vine of Christ, in fact, let's go back to John 15, so, we'll, so I can point it out to you in the passage here. Am I keeping you busy yet? Not going to give you a chance to go to sleep on me. John 15, he said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. So what happens to a branch that doesn't bear fruit? What happens to it? Huh? It gets cut off, and what, what do they do with the branch after that? Throw it in the fire. You know what that is, don't you? I don't want to go to the fire. So, and this is something God taught me, Brother John. It's not my responsibility to produce fruit. God is the one who produces fruit. It's my responsibility to bear the fruit. That's the easy part. Just believe what God said, and God will manifest the fruit in you. Amen? So he said, every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now are ye clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit. Here it is. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. So let's take this word me, meaning Jesus, and let's add to that the Bible, because Jesus is the Word, and the Word is Jesus. They are not different entities. They are one and the same. And so if you abide in Christ, you are abiding in His Word. And He said, for without me, ye can do nothing. And I'm here to tell you, without the Bible, you can do nothing. Pastor can't preach without the Word of God. You cannot live without the word of God giving you the words of life, the words of eternal life. So he said in verse 6, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. 
If you abide in me and my words abide in you. See, he connected it right there. I wasn't just stepping out of line here. That's what the, that's what the word says. And my words abide in you. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye may bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. So the disciples of Christ are those who abide in the word of God, those who abide in the vine, that we have life from the vine. The vine gives us life. The vine gives us nourishment. And it's from the vine that you and I bear the fruit of eternal life. We bear the fruit of a Christian, love, joy, peace, patience, long suffering, all of those things that Paul said in Galatians 5. That's the fruit of the spirit that you and I bear. So let me ask you the question. Now that we've learned about two vines in the Bible, one, the vine of Christ, the true vine, meaning if it's true, it can never be false. It can never be wrong one time. We know then that the fruit of the vine of Christ are, is the body of the believers of Christ. That's the fruit. What is the fruit of a vine called Sodom? What fruit would Sodom produce? Let me give you the illustration. I told Brother John this. I found this out last week. We used to have a Christian school. And in that Christian school, we had a young lady. She came to us as a senior. She came from a church-going family. In fact, they, I knew the family. They went to King James Fundamental Bible-believing churches. She grew up that way. She graduated. She went one year to our school. She graduated. And then she went out into the world. She's now married and they're raising a child, and she attends a church not too far from our church in Festus, Missouri. This is about 10 miles north. It's called Oak Bridge Community Church. Almost said Oakland Community Church. Oh, I forgot to tell you, she married a woman. She's a sodomite. And... She's got on her Facebook page pictures of her and her wife and all these little memes about how she is a Christian and an open married sodomite. And the baby had a little t-shirt on, said, I love my moms. Going, not just going to the church, serving in the church. Helping with vacation Bible school. The church using open sodomite to help train the children of that church. Does anybody have a problem with that? Thank you. So here's the thing. She was taught different. She now has come to a place in her life where she found a church where she not only knows that her sin is never going to be preached on. They're using her as part of the team to help bring other people into the church. Okay? So you decide. See, our enemies themselves being judges... What vine are they drinking from at that church? True vine? Vine of Sodom. So what's the fruit of the vine of Sodom? Sodomy. Open sodomy. Churches openly accepting sodomites into their congregation and using them. That's just one example. There's another church that I was associated with years ago, that their music minister, him and his wife, in an unfortunate situation, divorced. is because she found out he had boyfriends. So she divorced him. They kept him on as music minister. So she comes to church with her boyfriend. He comes to the same church with his boyfriend. And nobody says a word. 
Nobody raises a fuss. There are no deacons meetings that are held. There's no doctrinal issues that are discussed. It's just, this is the way it is now. Because they drink from a different vine than this church drinks. Now, I want you to understand, and I said this Sunday, I would love for those two women to come to my church. I would love them. I would accept them. And I would sweetly, gently, and lovingly preach against their sin while they were sitting there in hopes that they would convert and let God change them and make them into His image. Okay? So it's not that I hate people. I love them. But I love them enough to tell them the truth that they're not being told at the Sodom Vine of Sodom Church. So do you understand now, back to Revelation 17, because that's kind of where we started, right? That was an hour ago. You kind of get an understanding now what she holds in that cup, don't you? She's got the wine from the vine of Sodom in that church. And it's not just sodomy. It's all kinds of fornication that's in that cup. And so it's not just sodomy that's going to be manifest. It is open adultery. It is uh, church members and church leaders living in fornication lifestyles, adulterous lifestyles, open-ended marriage life. You, you name the fornication. This is now starting to become manifest. At, see, the fruit's coming out, isn't it? Before, we couldn't tell the difference between the churches. But now the fruit is being manifest. No pun, well, maybe there is a pun intended. The fruits are being manifested, and now it's starting to get easier to see what kind of churches are and are not based upon the Word of God. Amen? Uh, let's learn something about the beast, shall we? Let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2. Well, I'm having fun, and I haven't even got to the slides yet. 2 Thessalonians 2. Let me show you... Let me show you one aspect, one character trait of the beast, of the man of sin, what he's like. Um, let me just, while you turn to 2 Thessalonians 2, let me kind of go around the room. Just give me an idea, your opinion of, let's say, let's say at some point, at some day, the beast is going to be manifest. He's going to be revealed, okay? How close do you think we are, Pastor? How close do you think we are? And... I don't have the answer, so I'm not going to say, wrong! <laughs> well, that was a really generic answer, wasn't it? Well, we're close. You're a genius. No, that's a good answer. Year? Five years? Ten years? Twenty years? Within ten years. That's pretty specific. Okay? Life insurance policy is paid up. Anybody else take a guess? Maybe it's 20 years. Maybe it's five years. Okay? We don't know the day or the hour. We don't know the year. But we are told about certain signs, right? And all through the Bible, I mean, we're told about how to look at the signs, how to see the signs, like trees bringing forth leaves or tree, certain fruits coming forth on certain trees. Those are all signs, right? They're signs of seasons. I mean, we know when crops are supposed to be ready for harvest. We know that. We know lots of other things about the seasons of the areas that we live in, and we can say, yeah, after the first frost, this is what we're going to do, or after the you know, whatever, last frost, this is what we're going to do. We kind of understand the seasons of the area that we live in. And I, I think it's right and proper to look at the condition of the world that we live in and definitely see that it's not harvest yet. But boy, we're getting close, right? Huh? See? <laughs> wise guy. 2 Thessalonians 2. Let me show you an aspect of the beast, one of his character traits. 
I'm in 1 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians 2. Now we beseech you, brethren. And by the way, I'm going to throw something. I'm going to throw you a curveball on what you might believe about the translation. You believe the translation is the rapture. How I many of you believe in that? You should. It's going to happen. Whether you believe it or not, it's going to happen. Okay? Um, how do I know? Well, I need two witnesses. If I were to ask two men out of the Bible, do they think that God is going to take people who have never died and take them into heaven, I would ask Enoch and Elijah because those are two men that it happened with them. So they would tell me, oh yeah, and it's great too, okay? So I believe that. I believe there's a generation of God's saints that's going to leave this earth and meet Jesus in the air and they're not going to see death. That's 1 Thessalonians 4, that's 1 Corinthians 15, that's Genesis 5, that's 2 Kings chapter 2. It's even in the story of the Ten Commandments. You can see it in the story of David marrying Abigail. I mean, there are pictures of it everywhere in the scriptures. This is why I believe it. When is that day going to happen? When? Are there things that are going to happen prophetically before the translation now we beseech you brethren by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him that is the translation Christ is going to gather us together right then he said that you be soon that you be not soon shaken in mind have you ever been shaken in your mind you ever had you ever had news come to you that shook you and you didn't know how to handle it. Okay? There is an evil day coming. He says in verse 11 that it's a day of strong delusion. So strong delusion is coming. And Paul says, I don't want you to be shaken in mind on that day. I want you to be sound in your mind. God's given you a sound mind. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, because spirits can trouble you. Can they? you ever had spirits trouble you? Okay. I'm not much afraid of men. But I am deathly afraid of spirits. Because I've dealt with them before. And they're not fun. They will shake you. Usually every time I go to Kenya. No kidding. I get shaken. I get troubled by spirits. Nor by word. Nor by letter. As from us is that the day of Christ is at hand. So verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means. Let no man deceive you by any sermon. Let no man deceive, let no man deceive you by any Bible. Because there are Bibles that are nothing but deception. Let no man deceive you by any YouTube video. This is the 21st century version of this. Let a man deceive you by any website or any Facebook post. For that day shall not come. What day are we talking about? The gathering. That day shall not come except there come a falling away first. What's going to happen first? The falling away or the gathering? Falling away is. That's what it says. That verse changed my mind. Because I used to think nothing happens before the rapture. I used to think that. I didn't know why I thought it. It's what I was always told. But that's what I used to think. And then I read this. And I went, now wait a minute. The gathering... If you want, I can take you through 20, 30 scriptures that shows you that the, the gathering here is us being gathered with Christ. Okay? So, the gathering is us being taken, met, meeting Jesus in the air with the dead in Christ. We're going to be gathered together. But he said, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And, so this is connected to it, that man of sin be revealed. So he's not revealed yet. So don't buy some ministry's video that says 
Antichrist revealed on it. Because you're wasting your 30 bucks. Because they don't know. That man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Now here's why I wanted you to look at in verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. Notice that the man of sin exalts himself above everything that is called God. Right? Is Jesus called God? Yeah, so he's going to, be exalt, he's going to exalt himself above Jesus. What else is called God? Anybody know? Give me some things that, that are God. This is going to be a long night because I ain't, I ain't moving until you answer. Huh? Turn to John 1. John 1. Let's see how we doing on time. There you go. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So what is he going to do, John? The man of sin is going to exalt himself above the Bible. So let me, how, let me tell you how to identify the spirit of Antichrist, because John said, you've heard that Antichrist shall come, and yet there are many Antichrists. And he talks about the spirit of Antichrist already is at work. So any place where a man exalts himself above the Bible. And I'll, give you, I'll show you how it looks because I used to do it. Okay, It was with me, it was a forgivable sin because God forgave me of that sin. But I used to do it a lot. I would be reading. Now... Um, in verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Now, that is a poor translation. The original Greek, this word apostasia, actually gives the idea of being caught as opposed to falling. So what this verse really says is, is that there will be a catching away. Then the man of sin will be revealed. What did I just do? I just changed the doctrine. I just changed apostasy into the rapture. Now, I didn't just make that up in my head. Pete, somebody sent me a Jimmy Swaggart expository Bible. And in every verse, and I mean right in the verse text of a King James Bible, the Swaggarts, introduce their own commentary right into the text. And in that verse, the Swaggart said, this is a poor translation. It really should read catching away rather than falling away. So therefore, this says that the rapture will take place before the man of sin is revealed. You know what they just did? They exalted themselves above all that is called God because they said that we're right and does what you read in the Bible is incorrect. That's the spirit of Antichrist. How many places does that exist? How many churches in Laclede County is that going on? Not in this one. Amen? All right, let's get into the slideshow. I have a slideshow for you. I have pictures and everything. Revelation 13, 1. I stood upon the sand of the sea. You can turn to Revelation 13 if you want. Read along with me. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Was he really a beast? Yes. Having seven heads. Does he really have seven heads? The Bible says he has seven heads. And ten horns. Does he really have ten horns? The Bible says he has ten horns. I killed one of them rascals. A big old buck with five on this side and five on that side. Amen. And upon his heads, and he had upon his horns ten crowns, upon his heads the name of blasphemy. The beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear. His mouth is the mouth of a lion, and the dragon, we know who the dragon is. The dragon, Satan, gave him his power and seat and great authority. So, let's look at this idea of this man. He's, is he a man or is he a beast? What is he? Is he a man? Is he a beast? Look in verse 18. 
of Revelation 13. Verse 18 says, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. Well, which is it? Is it a beast or is it a man? Can it be both? Today it can. In today's world, it can be both a beast and a man. My father-in-law has a mechanical valve in his heart. They would have given him what they normally give valve replacement people, which is a valve from an animal, namely a pig. They put valve, heart valves from pigs into humans, but they have to give them all kinds of anti-rejection medicine because the white blood cells just hate something new in the body and they try to destroy it. And so he, these people take all this medicine to, to keep that stopped, all right? But normally they would put a pig valve in a human heart because it just seems to work pretty well. And they've done it thousands of times all over the world. So the thing is, can they ever have a valve from a pig that they can put into a human heart and the human body not reject it? Yes. Because of what's called CRISPR gene, gene editing. I may explain it, I may not, but let me just give you the rundown. DNA is a book you've heard me talk about. In thy book, all my members were written. DNA is a book. And it's got words in it, it's got sentences in it. Those are the genes that make up the members of our body. Well, one of the members of our body is the valve in our heart that lets blood go in and out. So what they said, what they decided to do was, they said, let's take pigs and let's genetically modify the pigs so that the heart of the pig has more human qualities doesn't, than it does pig qualities so that neither the pig nor the human will reject the heart so it's a combination of both human and pig material genetic material in the same heart so they then take the heart the valve out of the pig put it into the human now the human accepts it as a human valve but it didn't come from a human it came from a pig is that in your bible Turn to uh, Daniel. Turn to Daniel, chapter 7. See, I wouldn't ask you if it's in your Bible unless I knew it was in your Bible. I just happen to know that that is actually in your Bible, like word for word in your Bible. Mm -mm -mm. Daniel, chapter 7. Verse 2, and Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings, and I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's what? Was given to it. And by the way, the heart in the Bible means two things. It means the literal pumping thing that pumps blood, but the heart in the Bible also means the seat of our being, the, the center of our consciousness. For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. It's the heart, the soul of a man, the heart, that gives him the ability to believe in what God said. So what we're seeing here, not only is a surgical procedure putting a man's heart into a lion, but also the very soul and the ability that men have, that animals do not have. Men can decide not to eat if they don't want to. They don't normally do that. Right? Right, Caleb? If we say, Caleb, we got food... Nah, I don't want to. Doesn't happen. Okay? Men can make decisions against their nature. Men can say, that's not my wife. I'm not going to mate with her. Right? Men? It's a good idea. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Beasts cannot do that. 
Beasts cannot turn down during mating season. Mating. They cannot turn down eating something when they're hungry. They can't turn it down. They can't make those decisions. So the idea of giving a lion the heart of a man is basically giving a beast the, that man's ability to choose. Man has ability, man has a will, a free will. We can choose what we can do and what we cannot do, what we will and what we won't do. That's man's will. They've now put that into the, the essence or the character or the body or the being of a beast. In this case, a lion. In Daniel chapter 4, turn there, just the opposite. In Daniel chapter 4, uh, let's see here. I probably won't be able to find it. But in Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar has the dream where the tree is cut down. Daniel tells him, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the tree. It's because of your pride, you're lifted up. And what's going to happen is God's going to turn you over for seven years. You're going to grow claws. You're going to grow hair like eagle's feathers. You're going to walk around on all fours. You're going to eat grass out in the backyard of the palace. And, and Daniel chapter 4 literally says a beast heart was given to him. So in Daniel 7, we have a man's heart given to a beast. In Daniel 4, we have a beast heart given to man. So here's the question in Revelation 13. He's the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2. But in Revelation 13, he is a beast. Is he man or beast? Both. He's both. And so, again, we're in the age of genetic manipulation that now is so easy. They sell kits for about 35 bucks that a high school boy in his bedroom next to his Iron Man poster can rewrite the genetics of a little one-celled organism as easily as he can write a term paper or sign his name to a piece of paper. That's how easy it is now to rewrite DNA. For years, they've been trying this, and it, and it would cost millions of dollars. You remember back, back in the 80s and 90s when DNA recognition first started being used like in court? They reckon, you know, they can, and when they would send off a sample to a lab, it was months before they could turn back the results saying this is the DNA profile of this person. Now the turnaround is days, and it costs a lot less money. And so for years, writing DNA was extremely difficult. It was hit and miss, more miss than hit, and it cost millions of dollars. But in the last three years, the CRISPR gene editing system has, has taken over. It is a multi-billion dollar industry. And there are new pop-up companies all over the world that are waiting to get into the area of rewriting DNA. And for the first time in human history, we now have human embryos in America whose DNA has been rewritten for the first time ever. So, and I said this probably at your church, John, years ago. So let's say humans get cancer. Let's say sharks don't get cancer. Sharks don't get cancer. Okay? They don't smoke. Right? They don't get cancer, they don't smoke. So, we read in the shark DNA what keeps them from getting cancer. We take, in the human DNA, we take out what gives the humans cancer and we replace it with the shark DNA that keeps it from getting cancer. So now that species will not get cancer. But is that species human? It's not, and it's not no, it is no longer a child of their two parents. Because what makes a child, 
I mean, we came in today, she was here, and I'm going, you're Jessica's daughter. Right? Because she's got her DNA in her face and her attitude. <laughs> DNA's got attitude, right? Okay? So she is, she is as much her daughter because it's in her DNA. But if she has DNA taken out and other DNA from whatever source put in her, she's no longer her child. She's somebody else's or something else's. See, we don't know how to think this way. We have never done this before. But this Bible has been the same for thousands of years, and it said that this creature is a man and a beast. And I believe the Bible. I believe it now more than ever because now we can see how right this Bible really is. So let's look in verse 2. The beast which I saw was likened to a, a leopard. Look at there. He's likened to a leopard. And uh, his feet were as the feet of a bear, right? And his mouth is the mouth of a lion, okay? And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. So we look at this and we say, well, this is simply a metaphor because it's not possible that a leopard could be, have like these characteristics of a lion and a bear. That was in the old days, like two years ago, okay? Nowadays, there are creatures that have DNA from multiple other species that we we now know how to rewrite and put that stuff in and make whatever creature that we want to. They're releasing genetically modified mosquitoes all throughout Africa. These mosquitoes cannot pass on malaria. But what are we doing? When we genetically modify an entire species of mosquitoes, do we really know the full outcome? We're not smart enough to be God, but we're playing God, right? Man as God never works out, and it won't work out. And the dragon gave him his power and his seed and his great authority. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. 